This is James Taylor, and you're listening to The Creative Life. The Creative Life podcast is a show created for you, the creative. If you're looking for inspiration, motivation, and advice while at home, at work, or on your daily commute, then this show is for you. Each episode brings you a successful creative, whether that's a musician, writer, artist, designer, performer, educator, or creative entrepreneur. They share their journey, their successes, their failures, their creative process, their insights, and much, much more. In this episode, I speak with Jorge Barba. We talk about entrepreneurship, creative generalists, and being an innovation insurgent. Enjoy this episode. Hey, it's James Taylor. I'm delighted today to have Jorge Barba. Jorge is an entrepreneur, consultant, advisor, and innovation insurgent. His Game Changer blog and Big Band podcast are all about innovation, new ideas, and how the world is changing. Meanwhile, as an entrepreneur, he started five companies and be part of eight startups in both California and Mexico. And it's my great pleasure to have him with us today. So welcome, Hoy. Hey, Jane. Thank you for having me on. My pleasure. Share with our listeners what's going on in your world just now. What's going on is more than a few things. Um, I'm actively uh, working on more than a few projects related to drones, AI, and, uh, you know, the implementations in terms of uh, new management models. <laughs> and how, how long have you been getting involved in, in that side of things? Uh, probably like four years. <laughs> and obviously it's such a big area, the whole area of kind of drones is kind of rapidly uh, changing all the time. Is there a specific uh, area within the world of drones and artificial intelligence that you're interested in? Yes. Uh, in terms of drones, I'm interested in the... Um, I've been working this for... Just, oh, just just less than a year, and that's it's related to the drone shows. Like, uh, you know, doing spectacles with drones, basically, uh, that are uh, synchronized to a choreography. Ah. So, yeah, so a few years ago, I did, I, I created a, a um, what you call it, kind of like a, like a Cirque du Soleil production, but more, much, much, much smaller. But, and I wanted to introduce technology into it. And I, I, that was my first step towards experimenting with uh, integrating drones to it. So at that point, I didn't work exactly as I would, I wanted it. But now the technology has advanced a little bit more and uh, I'm pursuing it again. <laughs> it, it seems to be the fascinating thing about the, the drones, as I've, as I've seen them just now, is the, the sheer creativity that people are taking to it as well. I, I mean, it, it seems like every week something just kind of blows you yeah. away in terms of how it's being used. What, what are some of the most interesting ways that you've, you've been seeing that drones have been getting used recently? Oh my God! Um, you know it's funny because the the internet connects you to to people across the world and to uh, to to know what's going on across the world. And I figured, I mean, some 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 of these things you think about them yourself, and then suddenly you see somebody else doing it. You're like, wow, they figured it out. And I I, I uh, met this company called Colmot through uh, through the through the internet basically. And uh, they did a show for Shanghai, I think it was last year, and they were doing these things where uh, they have this this type of like a wristband on on the choreography, so the person's uh, arm or, or or wrist, and basically the drones will synchronize to the movement of the wristband. Oh, um, yeah. Nice. <laughs> so they can they can segment the drones depending on which ones they want to be uh, synchronized to that specific wristband, or they can synchronize all of them. So it's very interesting. All the technical problems that they that they solve to achieve that, um, so that's like, like an interesting thing. I mean, it's very small, but I mean, it's, it's <laughs> it, it makes a big difference when you when you look at it. <laughs> Absolutely, very cool. And how did you, I mentioned at the start of the show that you've you, you've really been a, a serial entrepreneur as well? Where did you kind of get the entrepreneurial bug? When when did the entrepreneurial entrepreneurial bug bite you? Um, I think it's. I mean, you don't you don't really know. I mean, I never I didn't arrive to it. I was just kind of. Uh, I just figured it. I just figured I was it. <laughs> um, the way I figured it was it is basically I uh, just holding different jobs and me being, uh, you know, uh, basically a, a renegade and not accepting things as they are and just uh, thinking there's better ways to do it. And when I started getting into problems with my bosses, quote unquote bosses, um, that's when I figured I can't. I can't do this. I mean, I have to. If I see if I see there's a better way, I just I'm just gonna go go and do it. I'm, I'm, I won't be asking for permission. I mean, I'm not going to bring the business down with me. It's just uh, you know something very simple. You go, you see it, you see a better way to do it, and you go and do it. And then, you know, sometimes it doesn't pan out to them the first try, but you keep trying, and that's how I kind of arrived to it. So 
it was more by accident than me simply being, uh, you know, knowing since I was young that I was an entrepreneur. I mean, it was more like I'm just uh, a renegade and I like, uh, you know, I don't, if, if, if I see an obstacle in front of me, I'm going to, you know, evade it, you know, throw it down or whatever just to achieve whatever I want to achieve. And that's how it is. And what about on the, on the flip side, as you build your own businesses as well, when, when you get your own internal renegades, so people that are coming and working within your businesses, what's yeah. from, from side of, of your perspective as a manager of these people, so what is the best way you think of when someone is kind of coming up with ideas and they have the, they can see better ways or they can see different, maybe different ways of doing things. What's the best way of ensuring that you're able to kind of harness that uh, and, and, and for the good of the business? Well, it's, for me, it's very simple because I I, I understand uh, somebody who's who has that bug like me. Um, so for me, it's very simple. I just get out of the way. I just I just uh, direct their energy or or eliminate obstacles in their way. I mean, obviously, we're all different. Uh, I have certain capabilities that other people don't have. So for me, it's it's if I you know get somebody on on board of my team, I'm always looking for that bug in them, even though we're different. Uh, most of the time. What I encounter or the people that I attract to myself are people who want to or see things differently, but they don't have that drive or, or, or they're a little scared and, and which I, I don't have any of it. Uh, so for me, it's very simple because I, I give them that, you know, I give them that courage, that, uh, that uh, courage and the drive to, uh, to push forward. And my, my whole job is to eliminate the obstacles in their way. And that's, that's how it kind of works. And um, you've you've built businesses and, and been involved in businesses in both uh, in the U.S. and California, and also in yeah. Mexico as well. I know you were kind of heavily involved in in the kind of the, the startup community in Mexico. What are some of the things that you've been seeing seeing there, and what are some of maybe some of the challenges you see there in terms of building an entrepreneurial uh, kind of ecosystem? Well, the, the 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 first thing we have to talk about is the challenges. So, in terms of the culture, um, it's very. I mean. It's very different from from the U.S. and even Europe, where uh, you know failure or learning from failure is encouraged a little bit. Uh, in Mexico, not so much. I mean, still still ongoing. Um, so people are not, you know, there's a lot of copycatting going on. So if something works elsewhere, they're just going to copy it, and and that's fine. I mean, it's part of it. But at the same time, you want to see real real thinking going on and, and courage. And that's, that's, that's my part, you know, that's, that's what I bring to the table all the time. So, um, uh, I mean, I'll tell you a little bit of, of, a, of a project I'm involved in. I have a, I've been advising this company and also have a piece of the business. Uh, the, the, the person who founded this company is not a local person. He is from Korea, but he ended up in Tijuana for some reason, <laughs> you know, just, just happenstance. And he ended up here building a very breakthrough idea. Uh, that has nothing to do with software. It's all about physics and how to control the air around an object to make it float. So you're not talking about a hoverboard and pushing air towards the ground. You're, you're talking about controlling air around an object, and, and that, that's how it's going to float. Mm. So it, it's very interesting. He ended up in Tijuana, and for okay. happenstance, you know, you know how it is. I mean, you just uh, bump into people, and I ended up, ended up uh, being friends with him now and involved in this company, help him, help him, helping him uh, push it. And uh, I always use him, use him as an example down here in Tijuana because he's somebody who doesn't speak the language uh, and uh, he doesn't know anything about Tijuana. He came here two years ago and he figured out how to, how to bring in a team and, you know, get it going. And, you know, that's, that's, uh, you know, that's something that t- requires courage, for, for, which for him is completely normal because he's been traveling across the world for his whole, whole life. But for other people, it's like that requires courage. So, I mean, that, there's a lot of that that still needs to happen. I mean, there's. There's definitely in Tijuana happening, you know, activities going on. When we started it, I started this in Tijuana about five years ago. Me and a few friends, we, we kind of, be, we came, be, we basically were the, were the, like the seeds that planted this whole movement in Tijuana of entrepreneurship. Uh, there was three friends and I'm, and, and right now you can see it because now the government's involved and stuff like that. But, it, but, but at the same point, at the same time, it's not, you know, we can't compare it to Silicon Valley to not even Mexico City or Monterey. I so, mean, we're still behind that. So, with with those with those kind of challenges, what's on the flip side? What do you see as the potential, um, the opportunities, or the the things that maybe that Mexico has or, or they have in Tijuana, which you think actually this we could turn this to our advantage? This is this is useful. Uh, the cross border collaboration is important, not just between the U.S. 
I mean, I'm based in Tijuana, so I'm right across the border from San Diego. Uh, I do business on both sides. Have have the, have been doing so for for a long time. And for me, it's it's really about crisscrossing and and and, and making people collaborate cross cross border. Um, I'm big on that, but also, in my my point of view, is we have we have talent down here. I mean, we do. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I've seen enough, enough, enough examples, and I've, I've also done business myself here, and I know there is. Uh, sometimes all it's required is uh, the right people in the right environment to make that talent, you know, potential, and also the right type of challenges. Um, I mean, I want to—I don't want to sound negative, but I was talking to a to a you know a, a girlfriend recently who's involved with the government doing entrepreneur activities. She wants me to mentor, uh, you know, young people. Or groups of 50 or whatnot. So I immediately asked her, "What do you? What are your your assessments in terms of talent? You know, compared to uh, you know the U.S. and stuff like that?" And she said, "Well, you can actually notice immediately when you put them next to U.S. talent." So I said, "Yeah. So there's there's stuff to learn, but it's good because that's that's how you open people's eyes to you know opportunities and potential that I can you know as long as you speak English." Um, and there's curiosity. I mean, there's no limits. I mean, there are no limits. There are no, and people just put their limits on themselves. And uh, it's been interesting. I've, I've noticed about some some countries. I think it's in in South America, in uh, in Chile. They're doing the very very strongly targeting uh, entrepreneurs from yeah. uh, from Europe just now because obviously so, you know similar in terms of the time zone from as, as like California but much easier in terms of the visa <laughs> side of things yeah. and I believe in yeah. Chile now has this I think it's, if you're an entrepreneur they'll they will give you fifty thousand dollars or so, so much yeah. money in order to go and start your business there and start kind of building a team there as well is that yeah. same kind of thing happening in Mexico? Um, so yeah, what you're what you're referring to is, or your listeners who might not know, it's called Startup Chile, and I was actually one of the first ones to apply to it, you know, about eight years ago or something like that. <laughs> um, and yes, I did try to do it here in Mexico, but not in Tijuana. They have we have to do it in, in in Mexico City, where there's number one more money and there's a uh, a much larger. Uh, you know, Mexico City is a is a hot spot. It's a it's a it's a worldwide city, so you have more people uh, coming in of all types of uh, you know, uh, you know, all types of people across the world. Tijuana is still very much uh, Mexican, um, so I I have had these conversations, but it's it's a uh, it's hard, man. <laughs> And you, it's you, hard to make it hard on you. <laughs> and you wrote a really interesting piece the other day on your on your blog on the Game Changer blog about uh, subtraction being the simplest path to innovation. And you mentioned uh, a, a business that you uh, you actually employ it with very very early in your in your working life. Can you can you talk us to about the idea of subtraction and and how that related to the work you were doing when you got started? Yeah, I think you're referring to the FedEx my FedEx story. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's uh, it's, an, it's probably the, the the most interesting story I have yet, simply because of the of the scale and my age at the at the time. I was 18, and I just happened to uh, jump on FedEx opportunity because I was in college and was looking for a job. <laughs> um, so I ended up in FedEx as a uh, loader, basically loading the trucks with the with the you know the, the mail and stuff and all those things, and. Um, my my instincts, you know, rapidly came into play on the first day, on the in the first 15 minutes when I noticed that, um, you know, this is how it's going to be, and I said, well, this is ridiculous. How can people do this every day? <laughs> not because I was not because I was scared of the physical work. I mean, I, I'm not scared of that, but more so the, you know, my instincts were saying, telling me there's got to be a better way than doing this every freaking day. There were you're standing, you know. You know, busting your back and you know carrying all these boxes and and also your your legs and your shins. So for the next three weeks, I decided to uh, to do some research and basically understand how the whole thing worked and then figure out ways to uh, to improve it, <laughs> to make it better. And that's what I did. Basically, I took a ten step process and turned it into five with uh, much less people, simply by simply by you know, breaking the rules and figuring out what worked and what didn't. Luckily, everything worked at the at the at the at the beginning, so my instincts were right, um, and I didn't bring anything down with me. Simply, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's funny because I had everybody. You know, I was the only Mexican there, 
So I had people challenging me, trying to, to make me quit. You know, they're putting all these obstacles in front of me just to challenge me. So I, 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 mean, I brought everything down. Every, every single challenge they put in front of me, I brought it down. While at the same time exploring how this thing worked and at the same time, you know, testing my hypothesis. And, you know, eventually, as I said, you know, those, those processes turned into five. And when, you know, unfortunately, and, 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 and these are things out of your control, but 9-11 happened in, those, in that time, particular time. So when the when the when the when the towers fell, and for some reason when the to- towers fell, uh, you know, my area or where where I was, I was starting sending more ma- more stuff through the mail, through FedEx, and so we started getting more volume, and it, it it came to the point where we started breaking records for like 27 weeks straight of just volume, and we were doing almost almost the same volume as the international hub in Los Angeles, mm. and we were doing it faster with less people. So that was the that was the breaking point when I started getting all this attention from, or we started getting, or my house started getting all this attention from, you know, from the headquarters. And then I I got a visit from the founder who wanted to meet me because they they told him I was the reason why all this stuff was going on. Um, <laughs> so how did, how did how did that conversation with Fred Smith, the founder of FedEx, go? Um, well, basically, he uh, well at this point uh, you have to understand I was 18. I didn't understand what. I mean, I, just, I didn't understand what business was or even leadership or management or anything like that. I mean, I, never, I didn't even know what a CEO was. <laughs> I mean, I was still, uh, you know, I understood there was a manager there, was your boss and stuff like that, but I never understood, you know, all these other things. But when he when he showed up and he told me that somebody was, was, was wanted to meet me, well, I was like, well, whatever, right? <laughs> somebody else, <laughs> because they, they had sent somebody else before. And um, when I when I walked into the door, he had this package in there or his, you know this little folder under basically uh he wanted to he offered me a, a an, an assistant manager job because he wanted me to to uh to manage the whole damn sort at some point um i was 18 so i mean you don't do that <laughs> but he understood that um that i had that i understood but he understood that i had a different view of things and i was doing it much much faster than anybody else and i had the uh I had the the backing of the people, so I had the backing of other employees. Uh, basically, I was the leader, without the title, and um, I didn't accept the offer because I was in, in college and I had big, you know, other plans. But what I did tell him or ask him ask of him was, you know, I want you to give me power without the title. I want you to make it official because I can improve this even more. But I need you to give it to me. And he said, was it like doing what? And I said, I want you to give me power of a manager without the title. I want to fire so and so people. And he was like, why? Because they suck. We don't need them here. <laughs> and I said, that's the number one problem. You know, we got the wrong people here. So I said, if you give me, if you give me the power and I can filter and I can be the, the filter to everybody who comes into the to work here, you know, we'll be in better shape and build bigger things. And that's exactly what happened. So, so wh- wh- I, wh- where did that confidence come from as an 18 year old just getting started in work to go and be having those conversations with the founder of one of the biggest companies, you know, in the world, biggest within kind of uh, logistics, anyway. Um, where did that confidence stem from? Uh, I'm naturally confident, <laughs> um, so I've been I've been like this my whole life. I think I'm, I don't remember. Um, I, I mean, I was shy before when I was younger, but but you know, I, I've always uh, been one to uh, to pursue whatever I think is is the right thing, and and if it's my way, it's going to be my way. <laughs> You know, I have to, I have to do it. I mean, obviously, I'll, I'll take uh, people's input into account, um, but you know, at the same time, I, I've always understood that uh, I have, I'm, I'm, I'm not normal in the way that I'm just very, very, very confident about things. Not in a, in an arrogant way. I'm just, you know, I just do my homework and then kind of like understand things and, and, and figure out ways that this could be done better without bringing everything down. Um, and I think that has to do a lot to do when, when I'm, you know, speaking with people and they seem like, what the hell is this guy talking about? I mean, this, this is ridiculous. Right. But for me, it's like, um, there's various reasons why I just become very confident in situations. And, you know, when I'm not that confident and I don't, I don't feel it, I'd rather not do it until I really, really get the feeling of it. So, so wait, um, how, how do you ensure then you, when you're going into it, cause obviously now you, you consult and you advise other companies and, and startups as well in terms of their innovation process and, 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 and generating new products and services. Where do you though go for your new ideas? Where do you go for inspirations? How do you continually keep developing that curiosity of mind and that inquisitiveness? Oh, I mean, there's, it's everywhere. <laughs> it's everywhere. 
there is no there is no single point where I don't get ideas from. I mean, I like I like learning from anything. Um, I'm 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 very much a generalist, so uh, I'll get into any type of idea thing, even though I've never done it before. Like I said, I mean, I produced a I produced a movie before about two three years ago, and I produced this uh, Circus Soleil production. You know, I have no no background in doing artistic stuff, but I like it. I like storytelling. So for me, it was a, a way of learning. It was it was a a quick way of understanding something and then just learning and say, I'm going to use this later on. And it helps me towards other things because it gives me another, another lens to look at through challenges. So for me, it's, it's an ongoing thing. I mean, I don't uh, have this specific thing. I mean, I do have some practices that I, that I do. Like I have this idea box where I keep stuff and every once in a while, if I'm stuck or whatever, I'll just go in there and, you know, <laughs> get some inspiration from that. And is, is that, but, is that um, like a, is that notebooks or is that an actual physical uh, box where you just kind of throw things have, in? I've had I have three oh, I've had I've had both so it's I mean three so it's the physical one the notebook and the the, the my Evernote <laughs> yeah so I do I do three <laughs> so when when you're when you're kind of all those ideas are kind of going around like uh, like soup I suppose in in your head but you, you mentioned something interesting you said about being you consider yourself a generalist in fact you you co-founded something called the Society of Creative Generalists. And yes. we hear now, you know, in, in years, you know, the, since really the Industrial Revolution, specialization has always been the thing that's been drummed into. We need to become more specialized because you'll get paid more and you'll be more valued in society if, if you're more of a specialist. But it's, yes. but you, you have a different take on that, though. Yes. Um, you see, special, you know, specialization has a expiration date. <laughs> not, not you, I mean, gr- I mean, trees don't grow to the sky <laughs> in the same, the same with uh, any any business that's based on a very specific assumption of when they started, uh, that assumption is going to be proven wrong at some point, simply because things are, things evolve and, and with you, you know with evolution is specialization. So that's where the generalists come in. Uh, yes, we we generalists also specialize, but we don't over specialize. We we have a you know much more uh, larger knowledge pool to pull from where that creativity comes from. And, uh, you know, creativity is not, uh, you know, it doesn't have a, an expiration date. It has a, that's much, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's ongoing. I mean, it's, 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 it doesn't stop. I mean, it's, it's really up to us to, uh, to determine, uh, you know, its value. Uh, so, we so just got to focus the, on the right problems. And the the the, the criticisms often thrown at uh, people, uh, at generalists, is that well, that's fine. You're you're a uh, jack of all trades and master of none. Or you know, you should really just do thing and do one thing and do it do it well. So, what do you say to those critics that say that's the way people should be focusing on becoming specialists rather than generalists? Um, I I point out. I mean, I, I don't want to. Say I point out to Elon Musk because <laughs> everybody seems to be. Uh, you know, just like Steve Jobs, everybody seems to be, uh, you know, praising praising him. Yet he is not a specialist. He's never been one. He is very much a generalist. Same with Steve Jobs, and and same as a lot of other, you know, famous people, entrepreneurs. They're all, you know, in, you know, generalists, um, and that's how they start. I was recently interviewing someone, uh, one of our guests, who was talking, who just had a book out, talking about exactly what you said there about, the, especially because we have things like automation happening, robots, uh, machine learning, the actual role of the specialist is going to really reduce. And w- w- the, the people that are going to be valued are what you were just saying, the people that are generalists, people that can look at one, something from one area and look at something yeah. from another area and create something in, in, entirely uh, entirely new and he was talking about this idea at stanford they talk about the fuzzies and the techies so the fuzzies being yeah. the people that do all the arts and culture stuff and then the techies being the you know the, the geeks and the programmers and the coders and he said what's the the big change that's yeah. happening now is 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 getting merged up so that you that that that, de- that definition between those different specialisms is not valuable anymore it's about the yeah. idea of taking being both a fuzzy and a techie <laughs> doing something unique yeah. with it I, I, I call it a hybrid mind. So you have, you have, you need to have people in the future. People need to have uh, the ability to, to think, you know, understand technology, also, you know, the humanities, but, and also how to, you know, how to make money, not because money is important, but because it's, uh, you know, it's how you're going to make your livelihood. <laughs> um, and nowadays, I mean, that's, that's becoming a lot more pronounced simply because at least my generation has, you know, those types of, uh, criteria in them, but the the much older generation is, is very much a specialist, 
And, you know, to your listeners, just to get make, make things clear, I'm not, we're not saying that specialists suck. We, they don't. Um, my teams are very much comprised of a few generalists, but very, but very much a lot of specialists um, in very different areas. But here's the, the critical thing is that those specialists understand that us generalists have something different that they don't have. So it takes a lot of maturity in a team to, to function like that. Otherwise, you're going to have a, a clash of egos, uh, which is what most of the conversations have, have going on. Um, and, uh, but yeah, it's a very interesting topic. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, so Hoy, t- tell us about a time then when you worked on a project, worked on a business, and y- you gave it your heart and your soul, put everything into it, but for whatever reason, it just didn't like, it didn't turn out like you'd hoped. And, and more importantly, what were the lessons that you, you took from that experience? Wow. Oh my God. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I've been, I've been a part of a, more than a few. Um, I think, I think one of the first, the, you always remember your first, your first one. <laughs> Um, and my first one or the first time I was part of a startup that was not mine, I remember, I remember that more because I was right, but we didn't, but I was not leading the parade at that particular moment. I was, I was right behind the CEO and when she's, she's a friend of mine, but at that point I understood how much emotions color people's decision-making. Um, and whereas I played a role in not in being objective. And that also gave me a, uh, a much, you know, an, not an epiphany, but more of a direction as what else I bring to the table and how I can morph myself to different situations. And basically that, that business was called Tooney and G. We sold uh, mom and baby clothing to uh, celebrity moms. So we were all over People Magazine and all these famous, uh, you know, magazines that cover celebrity. Uh, that's, how we, how, that's how we started getting no- known. Um, eventually became national in the United States. We, we got into all these stores, you know, Nordstrom's, Bloomingdale's, uh, and a few other ones that are pretty popular. But eventually everything came down because the products, the products w- did not make it or were not doing as good as we thought in the stores. And eventually the, the, when the economy, you know, the, the collapse of the economy hit in 2008, that hit us pretty hard. And, what I, what what what's funny about this? The reason I'm, I'm I'm telling the story is because before anything any of this happened, I pointed out to the CEO, my friend. I said, I said, Gigi, I think this is what's going to happen, and we cannot put our eggs in one basket uh, because then we're going to be we're going to be done pretty damn quickly. And I said because if this doesn't pan out, we're going to be in huge huge trouble. Mm-hmm. And she's like, No, no, everything's going to you know work. I mean, I'm friends with all these celebrities, so they'll, they'll, they'll back us. And I'm like, hmm, uh, something tells me that's not going to happen. And yep, it didn't happen. Um, and that was a big one for me because it wasn't, it wasn't my business, but I felt for my friends because I was, I was involved in it and I was making decisions already for, for them. And, um, you know, that, that, that lesson was a deep one for me. Absolutely, and I guess that's that's the value of, of any startup of having a trusted advisor there as well, yeah. or trusted advisors. You know, having maybe a, a like a, a mastermind of people that you trust and that you genuinely are looking out for the best for the business and the best long term, and who have the battle scars. They've been there before. <laughs> they've they've done yeah. those things. They've seen those mistakes, and 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 they can teach you from that as well. And obviously, that that's kind of you were looking to kind of help your 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 CEO friend with that. Can can you talk to us also about? Um, um, a time in in your life, your entrepreneurial and your your creative life, your your life as an innovation insurgent, where you had an insight or a light bulb moment. You said, "Okay, this is the direction I want to be going with with my life and and the work, the creative work I do." So it's not like an epiphany, but I'll tell I'll tell you a story because people always ask me about this. Um, so when when I figured out that. Uh, I, was, I figured things out pretty pretty young. I was like 15 or 14, um, so I kind of understood my my general direction. When the when the FedEx thing happened, that was part of that transformation, I guess. But the real epiphany came when when I was young and 15. I, I uh, my father uh, gave me this this little booklet written by Michael Jordan, you know, the famous basketball mm-hmm. player. So. Yeah. At that point, at that point in time, I was playing a bunch of different sports. I didn't have a, a sport to call my own up until that moment when I read that. I was like, I immediately identified with him because of the mindset thing. 
And I became obsessed with Michael Jordan and basketball to the point where basketball became my number one sport and still is very much so to this day. And the reason, the reason that's an epiphany is because I, I, I identify with somebody who was doing things and had that same mindset, that same, same thoughts that I never brought, you know, brought up myself, you know, uh, I, I thought it was weird. <laughs> uh, and then I read these things and I was like, it just, it just pretty much light, light a fire or unleash me. And ever since then, you know, <laughs> I'm not I'm not scared to speak my mind um, or to to uh, do whatever the hell I want. I uh, just do it, uh, whether or not it's going to work. You know, I don't really care. It's it's, it's more of, of, of giving it a shot and trying, giving your best shot. And you know, whatever happens, you know, then it happens. But and can, it's, you it's can you remember? Can you remember? Can you remember anything from uh, that book specifically where you kind of the light bulb went on? And you went, oh, that's exactly how I feel. That's that's why that's oh, that's the way I want to go. Um. I can't I can't remember specifically something that was written it, but the general idea is that you don't uh, you, you you don't have to be scared about about failing. <laughs> mm. That's uh, that's it. That's that's the general idea. Don't be scared. Just do it. And you've taken and, that, you've uh, taken it across everything. Obviously now with all these these different businesses that you've done as as well. Um, we were speaking right at the top of the show just about drones and different things. So I'm I'm interested. Do you have uh, any kind of online resources or tools or apps or thing, things like that that you absolutely love and you don't think you could probably live without now? Oh, uh, Evernote. Yeah. <laughs> Evernote is one. I use Mind Manager or Mindjet. Um, it doesn't really matter if it's MindJet. It could be any, any any other brand name. What matters for, to me is to have a space where I can just, uh, you know, as a generalist, I think most generalists are holistic. So we, we look at the, the, you know, system thinking. Yeah. So the mind map gives me that, that opportunity to put, you know, the pieces in one place and just, just start going at it. Um, so those two are, are very critical to my everyday other than that, uh, I pretty I have a pretty damn good memory, so I don't I don't keep a journal stuff like that uh, or reminders and stuff. I mean, just I just go. Uh, what else? Uh, well, obviously I write a blog, and that that serves its purpose too. People think it's for marketing. It's not. It really be, be, you know started out as me just putting my thoughts in some some place. I think it's very important to a creative person uh, to just put your thoughts somewhere and just share them, and then people if people like it, they'll they'll come at you, and that's essentially what's been going on with me. <laughs> for nine years now but i think that's interesting what you were saying about the the, the mind maps I, I i do a similar thing i, I would probably consider my i class myself as, as a generalist as well and i think the power of the mind maps for people who are generalists is it allows you to see connections uh between different things and it and yes. uh i think like you know writing like uh using word and, and documents like that are great at the edit stage but i think for a lot of journalists you want to you have these different often what can feel like quite fragmented ideas but you, by yeah. having them in a place in a visual space as you said that word kind of holistic you can see well how do these things fit together do they fit together what's the, what's the connections between those things so i think absolutely what you're saying you know guys like tony buzan you know, the kind of inventor of, uh, of of mind mapping um really fascinating kind of read about that i think that's an awesome tool to be using and i can see totally how you're kind of using that in combination with something like evernote uh, as well yeah and yeah. you mentioned that the the, the, uh, the Michael Jordan book earlier. If you could recommend just one book and also one record, one album to our listeners, what, what would they be? One book. Oh my god. Okay, so this is this this might be going hand in hand, but I like I like the books written by Robert Greene. Um, so Robert Greene has written I think five different books, and one of them is about Fifty Cent, the rapper. Mm-hmm. Um, it's called the 50th law, so it's the is the continuation of the the 48 laws of power, which he wrote. Those are very damn good books to have, not just to have them on the Kindle, but have, to have them physically. So I recommend people to read uh, the 50th law by Robert Greene, and if if that you know you know tickers their button, you know read the, all the other ones because you 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 won't you will you will thank me. Um, the the reason why I say the 50th law is because it's, it's it's not just about entrepreneurship, but it's also about life in general. And dealing with challenges and and you know looked at through the prism of of a, of a, of a rapper which which is very misunderstood and who is very much a a a, a generalist himself. <laughs> um, in terms of an album, wow, that's a good question. I've I've never been asked that before. 
what, what is, is there an album like when you're you're kind of going to go you know you're, you're kind of pumping yourself up you're getting ready to you know like think about you know an ideation session or you're 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 kind of getting ready to go out. what what that's what's the album now um i don't listen to a specific album i listen to to uh to uh, progressive house music mm -hmm. yeah. so that's what that's that's what's usually in my background when i'm when i'm in this mode um but it's not like an album i, I would tell people just to listen to uh to somebody like John Digweed, um, which is a very famous uh, DJ who does, you know, progressive house music. I mean, it's not like this uh, trancey music. It's more progressive house, so it has some melody in it, and you can actually listen to it and, you know, get into it. I mean, you don't have to, to like it. Just listen to it. It has melody in it, and, uh, you know, it gets you, I mean, at least it gets me into mood. <laughs> Absolutely. And we'll put all these notes on the, on the show notes. People just go to jamestaylor.me and just type in uh, Jorge Barber and you're going to find the links for all these as well. So um, let's imagine if you woke up tomorrow morning and you had to start from scratch. So you have all the tools of your trade, all the knowledge that you've acquired over the years, but you know no one, no one knows you. You have to completely restart. What would you do? Well, um, I I I'd, um, I'd say I'm a superhero. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would turn my I mean, I think I think we're all uh we all have some superpowers in us and uh we're all in our own superhero journey if you want to call it like that. Some people might like think like think about it like that, but I certainly think about my life in that way. Um and and I would I would make it even more uh you know, knowing what I know now, I would even make it even more obvious that, you know, what my what my superpowers are and, you know, what my superhero name is and stuff like that. I mean, I, I would even go further and just uh, even make up my own suit and stuff Absolutely. like that. I mean, I'm talking I, for serious here. I've I, thought about it before. <laughs> I, I remember when I, when, I, when I lived in California, um, uh, there was a lot of stuff I was watching one night about the what's the the Mexican wrestling because I grew up with, around wrestling and 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 oh, yeah, my yeah. grandfather was into kind of all that side and taking me as a kid to wrestling but this was in the UK and when I went to California they had obviously they have all the, the WWF and all that stuff but they they, they have yeah. the specific the, the Mexican wrestling as well wasn't the name for that Lucha Libre Lucha Libre <laughs> yeah and they and that's all yeah. about like superheroes and outfits and yeah it's, it, I'm, I'm yeah it's funny that you bring it up because I, I've liked Lucha Libre and the WWE WWF for a long time since I was a kid and you very much uh you know it's very funny how it works because we all know it's it's fake or or quote-unquote fake you know it's not real but we all get into it I mean we 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 we, we suspend this belief completely and get get involved with the characters <laughs> yeah we seriously think believe that these guys are like damn heroes and i've 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 I'm, i mean I've, i'm gonna say on your show i've actually i've actually cried when the undertaker retired uh you know in, in april mm -hmm. because the undertaker was my favorite 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 the wrestler and, and i've just involved with him so much that you know you see him you know put his gloves down you're like shit you know this is this is it <laughs> <laughs> It's, I mean, it's interesting. You know, think something like that, which you know, you know, on a on a on a, you realize it's 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 uh, being staged and everything, but it's transformational yeah. in that way. And you know, for the time that you're watching or the time that you're you're in there standing at the side of a ring and watching the side of a ring, it 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 does take you to another place. And it's it's very there's the kind of storytelling aspect, which kind of goes back to what you you mentioned earlier. You, you said you feel like at times that you are a storyteller. And that's part yeah. of what you're doing. Whether it's the you know the the stuff that you're doing now with with drones and and uh, the circuit de soleil with, with drones as well. So, what's the um, best way for listeners to connect with you to learn more about you, the projects and different things you're up to? Um, they can connect with me through Twitter at Jorge Barba, or they could just send me an email at uh, Jorge at Jorge A dot Barba at gmail dot com, or just visit my my, my blog. Awesome. Um, we'll put, we'll, we'll put all these in the show notes. Oh, hey, thank yeah. you so much for coming on the show. It's been a pleasure speaking to you today, uh, a fellow innovation insurgent. So it's great uh, learning all of everything you're doing and, and the amazing stuff that you're doing in, in Mexico and in, uh, in California as well. I look forward to catching up with you soon. All right. Thank you, James. Thanks for having me. Have a, have a great time. Hey, James Taylor here again. 
And if you're interested in living a more creative life, then I'd love to invite you to join me as I share some of the most successful strategies and techniques that high performing creatives use. I put them all together in a free downloadable ebook that you can get by going to jamestaylor.me. That's jamestaylor.me to get your free downloadable ebook on creativity.